Well, first, let me just say welcome, everybody, to the March community meeting of the Mid-Coast Watershed Council. I'm Trevor Griffiths, the, the Watershed Restoration Specialist. Many of you will probably notice the absence of our council coordinator, Evan Hayduck. He uh, apologizes he couldn't be here tonight, but um, luckily we're, we're joined by uh, members of the Iwaka Alliance here, John Goodall and, and Peter Hatch. Um, they'll be giving a presentation on uh, Oregon's lost sea otters, which I'm sure you're all well aware of, and that's the reason that you're here. Uh, so we're really looking forward to that. Um, maybe I'll, I'll skip any discussion of last month's attempt at a community meeting, but many of you I'm sure are aware of, of what happened there. So really pleased to have John and Peter back uh, after, after that debacle to try for round two here. And as you can tell, uh, as, you, as you experience going through the registration process, we've put some extra hurdles and safeguards in place to uh, hopefully ensure that things run smoother here. Um, I did wanna reiterate that the um, way this is gonna work, we're on a webinar version. So um, there's a Q&A option button at the bottom of the screen that you should see where if you have questions along the way, we'd appreciate it if you type them up and put them in, in the Q&A box. We're going to save all the questions until the end, and um, I'll work through those in the order that they're received and, and pass them on to John and or Peter, however they're addressed. And um, yeah, so we'll have a little Q&A uh, uh, session following the presentations here. Um, I will just say a couple of uh, announcements before we turn it over to them. Um, one is that following this, if uh, any of you are interested, we're gonna have our monthly um, board of directors meeting, which is open to any interested public members that wanna participate in that or listen in. Um, I will post the link to that in the um, chat box for everybody to see toward the end of the meeting here because we're gonna close out of this meeting and log into another meeting. So if anybody's up for that, that's our plan. You'll see that a little later. Um, also, just as a quick plug, we have a couple of future meetings coming up that um, should be great as well. In April, we're gonna be talking about uh, eDNA or environmental DNA with Kelly Karim. She's gonna be talking about some of the local work that we've been doing here using, using that new technology to uh, survey for lamprey populations, freshwater mussels and, and other things like that. So um, hopefully that, that piques your curiosity and you tune in, in next time. Um, and then following that, we're gonna be having a presentation in May about uh, pollinators and the benefit of um, native native plants and native pollinators and on the, the ecosystem and what you can do to help from a, a citizen science standpoint. So just a little plug for their, for future presentations, but um, uh, enough of that. We have a great presentation lined up for tonight. So thank you all for, for making it. Um, I see. <laughs> The numbers still continue to grow. So maybe I'll just reiterate one more time that if you have questions, please put them in that Q&A box down at the bottom of the screen and we will get to the questions at the end of the presentation. So thanks again for, for all coming. And uh, I'll just take a second here to introduce our, our speakers. We have um, John Goodell, uh, he is, both are from the Ilaka Alliance. Um, John is the director of science and policy there. He is a, a conservation biologist with experience in a wide array of disciplines, including conservation planning, wildlife policy, wildlife monitoring, habitat restoration, K 
captive wildlife husbandry and natural science history interpretation. Uh, he's also the past president of the Oregon chapter of the Wildlife Society. So, um, yeah, let's welcome John. Thank you so much for being here. And in addition, alongside him is, is Peter Hatch. He's uh, the secretary with the Alaka Alliance. And um, he's a member, also a member of the Confederated Tribes of Siletz Indians and works in the tribe's cultural resource office. He's been fishing, clamming, and crabbing in Lincoln County his entire life and wants to ensure that his descendants can all, always do the same. Uh, yeah, once again, thank you so much for being here and we are really happy to have you and look forward to, to hearing what you have to say. So with that, I'll turn it over to whichever one of you is gonna start the show here. All right. Um, hello, everyone. I hope that you can hear me. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and fire up our presentation here. Um, uh, John and Trevor, my audio is coming through okay? Yep, sounds good to me. Great. Okay, so um, before we were so uh, rudely interrupted, <laughs> um, uh, we were talking about uh, Oregon sea otters, uh, kind of their past um, and um, what the lack of them has has meant uh, to our detriment here in Oregon and the opportunities that we have uh, going forward to uh, restore that legacy of sea otters and uh, to get, give you some sense of why that's important. Um, but um, as, as Trevor said, um, John and I uh, represent an organization called the Ilaka Alliance, uh, that my late father Dave uh, had a big hand in in founding originally as kind of an informal grouping back in the day. Um, that in in 2018 we started as a uh, a formal. Uh, uh, now in 2020 we're, we're a 501c3, and our mission is to restore a healthy population of sea otters to the Oregon coast and thereby uh, help make Oregon's marine and coastal ecosystems more robust and resilient. And uh, we are a really uh, multidisciplinary group. Uh, we've got uh, some retired archaeologists, some uh, uh, tribal council representatives from all three of the coastal tribes, um, some uh, scientists, attorneys, and uh, conservation advocates of all stripes, um, and we're, we're coming together to try to make this happen. Our goals are kind of, at, at this stage, we, we have the twin approaches of trying to do the uh, scientific and economic assessment that we need to lay the groundwork for pot potential reintroduction, um, kind of following the model of other uh, successful or soon to be successful programs uh, like those for the California Condor uh, here locally in Northern California and Southwestern Oregon. Um, and then also to help the region achieve consensus on um, the idea that the restoration could be a benefit for all Oregonians. And uh, if we are successful in those two goals, um, then we're hoping that uh, in the next five to 10 years, we'll be able to, to move ahead with uh, restoring sea otters uh, to their place on the Oregon coast. Um, so with that in mind, if, if you like what you hear tonight, um, just to get the plugs out of the way at the top, you can visit our website, alakaalliance.org um, and uh, there's a whole lot to know uh, that we're not going to have time to cover here. Um, and you can sign up to receive our, our monthly newsletter, find out a little bit about what's going on. That's going to be especially interesting this year as we look forward to the completion of our, our feasibility study uh, by the end of this year. Um, you can also listen to uh, podcasts from a bunch of different area experts that, that John has done a wonderful job of putting together. Um, and uh, watch the videos from the previous uh, science symposia that we've held uh, both uh, virtually and in, in person uh, back before COVID. Um, so I'm hoping that um, usually with this kind of group, it, it's helpful to spend just a couple of minutes uh, reviewing the differences between sea otters and river otters um, because they're, um, uh, uh, 
they're pretty different. And but for those of us who have lived our lives in Oregon and, and um, you know, our, our experience uh, is mostly seeing river otters in the wild and seeing um, sea otters at the uh, Oregon Coast Aquarium and the Oregon Zoo, uh, we, we don't really have a, a good uh, sort of built in sense of the differences. So um, sea otters can be about three times the size um, for a good dog analogy, maybe compare like a German shepherd to a river otters, more like an Aussie or, or some kind of small, medium sized dog. Um, uh, the otters that um, you see in all the pictures floating on their backs with the, the shellfish uh, on their belly, uh, those are, are sea otters. Um, river otters, uh, by contrast, are the belly swimmers. They eat fish. Um, they are, are very differently proportioned. It's confusing to people some, because sometimes you will see uh, uh, river otters foraging in the intertidal zone. And back historically, we would see sea otters in Oregon's estuaries from time to time. Um, so that's where a lot of the confusion comes from. Um, anyway, uh, there are a couple of basic facts of sea otter biology that are important to talk about uh, that, and, and kind of underlie everything that John and I are going to be talking about uh, this evening. And, and so sea otters as our smallest uh, marine mammal uh, operate really differently than the pinnipeds, the, the seals and sea lions that we're used to seeing off of the Oregon and coast. Um, because they lack blubber, um, and so they have to uh, uh, they have to keep themselves keep the ocean out and keep themselves warm uh, by just kind of running like a little furnace and eating uh, a quarter to a third of their body weight every single day, and that um, means that uh, for their size and for their numbers, they have a really uh, strong effect on the ecosystem and, and down beneath them on the invertebrates and the environment around them, um, which can really structure the whole ecosystem uh, that they live in. The other thing um, that really gets to what I'm about to talk about is the way that they, they keep that uh, warm body separated from the ocean cold is by the thickest fur that exists, a million hairs per square inch. And um, it, so, so it's those unique attributes that really kind of underlie everything that John and I are going to be talking about tonight. So, as I said, sea otters are gone from Oregon and have been absent now uh, from our coast for a little bit more than 110 years. So it's important to think about the way that our baselines for what a healthy Oregon marine ecosystem is like um, are, are kind of based by on our experiences of the last three or four generations without sea otters. So we're presented with this basic question of how uh, do we weigh the importance of a species that's been absent for, um, you know, for a, a couple of generations now. And for me, uh, as an indigenous Oregonian, the way that I approach that question is uh, trying to think about what the importance of sea otters was uh, for my ancestors. And with that in mind, I think that a good place to begin the story is with, um, uh, with, with a woman who from uh, the same village as my great great grandfather. Um, uh, her name was Annie Minor Peterson and she was a really important linguistic informant uh, um, from her knowledge, basically, we, we have a lot of what we still know uh, of the Hanus Kus and Milik Kus languages. Um, she's uh, an incredibly important woman uh, for that reason, uh, it, uh, for us uh, indigenous Oregonians. And um, among the many stories that she knew and remembered from childhood and recorded with an anthropologist named Melville Jacobs, uh, who's up here in this picture, uh, was the story of an independent young woman, kind of like Annie herself, uh, who lived back at a time when the lines between animals and, uh, or I suppose we would say uh, animal people and human people, when those lines are a little bit blearier than we understand them to be today. And uh, 
anyway, the, the, this woman uh, lived out by the mouth of Coos Bay, just just south uh, by uh, Yoakum Point and um, uh, and Bastendorf Beach, kind of that area. And um, she would always uh, re refuse the suitors who would who would come around after her and and preferred to sit alone in her little work shed by the sea and um, and and weave and swim and and pass her time and watch the sea otters go by. And uh, one day after swimming in the story, she um, became magically pregnant uh, with this strange kind of otherworldly baby. And her, her family, uh, you know, not wanting this, this strange child in the house, uh, casts her out. And so they, they go to live, her and the baby, in their work shed by the sea until a mysterious young man comes one day and explains that He's the father of the child and the head man of, of the sea otter people and, and takes her and the baby out to live among uh, among his people, among among the sea otters. Um, and she passes the the tests that are, are put to a prospective daughter-in-law among the sea otter people and, and lives happily there for a year until her young sons, um, she has another son, um, until her sons hunting along the shore uh, see uh, old people that look like their mother going along uh, and weeping and she realizes that it, it's her parents who have uh, you know regretted casting her out and, and are, are ready to accept her back into their lives and so uh, to make the marriage good to, to formalize the, uh, their partnership with her and her new husband she uh, gathers uh, two canoes full of valuables and, and lands on the shore to uh, to meet uh, her, her family again and, and uh, present them with these gifts of the sea, uh, um, you know, it, and uh, to cement that relationship and ensure their prosperity going forward. And uh, when she returns to live with the sea otter people, uh, she gives the admonition that, um, that sea otters will be seen as long as there are still, uh, still people alive uh, to interact with them. And so that interconnectedness that is outlined in that story, I think is, is a guidepost for me and is why um, it is how I approach these kind of issues and, and that sea otters are um, for me a, as a coastal tribal person, a, a species that you, you, that is important to us, that we have a responsibility of stewardship to. Um, and that is something that's um, uh, that, that elders uh, have talked about in all kinds of different contexts. Basically, um, you know, in our belief, uh, the the regalia that we we clothe ourselves in, and our, our the the things that that make up wealth uh, for us are uh, are all related to that stewardship. You know, they are of the, the beautiful things that come from our land, you know, the abalone shell and the woodpecker scarlet and the, uh, and the dentalia shell. Um, and, and the most valuable single thing uh, for our people going back uh, would be uh, the, the robes, uh, winter robes made from the skins of sea otters. And so when you, um, uh, when you look back uh, through, uh, what we have down from, from previous generations of elders, they, they talk about uh, exactly as in the story, you know, sea otter skins being something that would be used in as part of a, a marriage payment to formalize the bond between two families or uh, something that, uh, you know, a headman uh, going out and visiting and doing diplomacy would make sure to, to, to clothe himself in to be, you know, uh, really uh, putting on the Ritz, you know, as, as uh, impressive as he could possibly be. There's lots of other things that, uh, you know, uh, traditional understandings of, uh, of sea otters and ecology uh, can tell us about Oregon's former uh, indigenous sea otter population. Um, you know, it's notable that um, it's, there's clearly no absence of sea otters along our coast, even though they, they were more plentiful in certain spots. You know, there, Obviously, there's a word for sea otter in all of the different, um, very diverse languages along our coast originally, uh, spoken by our folks um, on the Salette's Reservation. Um, there's plenty of indications that, that sea otter uh, were abundant going back um, in many sites, uh, such as uh, Nasoma Village uh, down in Bandon or the Partee site um, up on Tillamook Bay. 
uh, consistently, sea otters are basically the second most common type of marine mammal bone found in the mittens um, behind, uh, you know, the um, uh, behind the pinnipeds that, that our people always needed um, for their fat for the winter time. And uh, there's lots of specific information about uh, where and how sea otters were harvested, either from shore or, or hunting from canoes. Um, and that, that can tell us, you know, to, to some degree of detail about the, the habitats that, that sea otters uh, were accustomed to when, when we did have them. Um, in fact, you know, in, in many ways, the, um, it, it's not subtle. The, uh, the sea otter heritage of the Oregon coast is right underneath our feet. You know, the, we uh, can go today to Otter Rock in Lincoln County or Otter Point uh, down in Curry County. And indeed, if we look back for the indigenous place names for those places, they are uh, Asihigal Shantish, uh, just Sea Otter Rock for Otter Rock, and Hashtash uh, Say, Sea Otter Rock, again, for Otter Point. Um, so, like I said, it's, it's a heritage that's right underneath our feet. And, you know, even though these, um, the mentions of specific places for sea otter hunting or specific place names that are named for sea otters are relatively few, it's notable to me that uh, when you map them out against uh, modern projections of anticipated sea otter habitat uh, and, and their expected density if they were to fully repopulate our coast, it's basically, you know, a, a one for one match. Every place that um, what was good sea otter habitat then is good sea otter habitat now. Um, so the question is, how did we go from that interconnectedness and balance and, and, and you know, millennia of sustainable hunting uh, of our people and sea otters to having none? Um, and that story is integrally connected to how it is that all of the world's empires uh, turned their attention to uh, our far-flung, very remote uh, little patch of, of the Pacific coast. And uh, that story really begins with, with Empress Anna of Russia, uh, pictured here on the left, who uh, sent Vitus Bering, the man pictured here on the right, to explore the far uh, um, the far east of her domains to see if it connected up to all of, uh, to North America and whether she could claim a piece of all of the many fortunes that were being made. So this was in uh, 1741 and uh, Bering uh, traveled across Siberia and set out into the sea uh, that uh, would soon bear his name and uh, ship was shipwrecked on the island uh, that still bears his name. Um, and Bering did not survive, but many of his men did on uh, the flesh of stellar sea cows and, uh, and, and what sea otters they could catch. And uh, brought it back and, and realized what a, uh, what a handy profit they could make at the one port where the Russians and the Chinese uh, traded um, down south of Kamchatka. And so on return trips to the islands, they noticed um, how much more adept the indigenous people, the uh, Unanga uh, Ali people, um, were at at hunting, uh, at hunting the sea otters. So much more adept than the Russians in their in their big slow boats were. Um, and so, uh, th those crews, the those uh, uh, those Russian traders, you know, acted as empires all over the world tend to do, and enslaved the locals and put them to work. Um, and so uh, those, uh, those Aleut crews uh, and their, um, their Russian oppressors uh, kind of worked their way along the whole Aleutian chain and then down through Southeast Alaska and further south and further south, just kind of exploiting the sea otters uh, as they went along wherever they were plentiful. Um, and that's how it comes um, and that's how it comes to be that uh, probably, to the extent that we know for sure, um, most of uh, Oregon's indigenous sea otter population went to uh, line the fringes of the robes of the 
the elite in the Chinese imperial court and in other uh, markets in, uh, in East Asia. Uh, the Russians traded and raided as way far south down the California coast, um, even you know, establishing a, a Russian fort there at Fort Ross, California, um, to grow wheat for the, the uh, workers up in Sitka and, and their other bases uh, in Alaska. And um, and so their their impact was felt, and uh, word it, word got out pretty quickly of this incredibly rich trade that was going on. And so the Spanish and the British, and eventually the Americans, uh, worked to again get a piece of this this very uh, valuable action, the maritime fur trade. Um, the Americans joined uh, into that market and. Uh, right here off of uh, Cascade Head, uh, approximately, uh, in July of 1788, when the Lady Washington came across a, a crew uh, of, of six men on, on a big trading canoe out in the ocean and uh, bought three sea otter skins off of them. Um, notably, the mark of uh, the empires had already uh, touched our people by that point, uh, they noticed, uh, or, or the um, the diary of this encounter that we have uh, mentions that half the uh, crew of the trading canoe were already uh, had their faces deeply marked by the smallpox. And uh, indeed, some of the major historical events that uh, we like to uh, uh, lump into our, our story of Oregon have to do with the sea otter trade. If you look at Thomas Jefferson's uh, description or, or, or Thomas Jefferson's instructions to, uh, uh, to Lewis and Clark as he was sending them west, he basically asks them, you know, once you get there, if you can try to uh, uh, get a piece of the same action that the British are, are benefiting so much from at Nootka Sound. Um, and so this process, the, this maritime fur trade just kind of rolls along. Uh, we're not even really here in Oregon uh, at the center of it. We're in a, a fairly marginal region where sea otters were probably never as, as incredibly plentiful as they are saying in the kind of intertwined channels of the inside passage in Southeast Alaska and all of that. Um, so our, our pop, sea otter population was easily decimated. They were much reduced even by the middle of the 19th century. Um, and as far as we can tell, uh, as far as our uh, researchers have been able to show, this little newspaper item from the Coos Bay Times in 1910 is, uh, at least for, uh, for our purposes, the end of the story. Um, when George Forty uh, killed a, a sea otter just off of Port Orford and uh, and hoped to sell it for five hundred dollars, which I think is something around uh, uh, thirteen thousand dollars adjusted for inflation. So um, only pockets of sea otters across their entire habitat survived uh, this this devastation that I am uh, describing here. J just thirty or so otters down in California and Big Sur and then in pockets along the Alaskan coast. Um, an, uh, there was a, a brief bright spot here in Oregon um, that has proved to be a lot more successful uh, up in Washington. All, all of Washington's otters and, and, um, and those of Southeast Alaska and, and British Columbia come from reintroductions that happened uh, in the 1970s when uh, the uh, the United States wanted to perform some nuclear testing on Amchitka um, Island uh, um, in the Aleutian chain and um, were persuaded by environmentalists to attempt some reintroductions. Um, and, and those were successful as it happened everywhere where they were tried, um, but not um, in Oregon over time. The, the population that was introduced um, in total about 100 animals um, uh, had a lot of mortality right off the bat, which we would expect um, even today, even in a, a, even with all of the, the greater knowledge about animal care uh, that we have. Um, and it's, so it's thought that many just emigrated north uh, almost immediately, and then the remainder just sort of dwindled away um, through mortality and, and got below a population that they could ever recover from. And so um, that's, 
a lesson that we have to take from, um, and we remain in the middle of this kind of 800 mile gap in sea otter habitat. Um, and that's the state of things today. That is easily where the story could end. And it could be um, that we would never see, uh, you know, the children of sea otter woman in our belief uh, again, um, except we find ourselves at um, a moment of opportunity that is not just important for, for me as a tribal member, but it is important for uh, for all of us who care about the uh, the ecological health, robustness, and integrity uh, um, of the Oregon coast. And to talk a little bit more about the details of the opportunity that we have in front of us, uh, I'm going to turn things over to John. Um, thank you very much for listening. Uh, don't and I can go ahead and take questions um, by text in the Q and A while, while John speaks, if that's all right. Thank you, Peter. Okay, just one second here while I get this started. Okay, well, thanks again, Peter. Um, I'm going to try, try not to go over too, many, too, too much of the same material and really focus in on some of the ecology and, and conservation of kelp and, and, and sea otters and, and then end here with uh, a little summary of what we're, what, our, what we're planning to do or what we are doing and, and planning to do this, this next year and sort of how you can, and how you can help. Um, you know, as Peter may have mentioned, uh, you know, the sea otter is a very, uh, this is the sea otter and it's very, Charismatic species, uh, you see them, in, as he had, had mentioned, in, in some of the remnant populations that are uh, that survived in California, and then the, re the reintroduced population in the Olympic Peninsula. And between that, those two places is an 800-mile gap. So there's this enormous gap between between those two, uh, what you would call vestiges uh, in the historical range of the sea otter. Um, but I wanted to, to really start talking a little bit about uh, ecosystem concepts and in, in, in the conservation of sea otters and the marine coastal marine ecosystem, the kelp ecosystem. And I'm sort of going to present here a pretty simple, uh, simplistic concept or analogy to do with diversity. And this is the Yellowstone ecosystem, and you have two apex predators, uh, the grizzly bear and the, the gray wolf. And we know that although there's a lot of comp complex uh, influences in these ecosystems to do with precipitation and and you know other factors that certainly those apex predators have this top-down effect. They call it a trophic cascade, but a but a sort of top-down influence on the prey and therefore the prey's influence on habitat. And, and what we know in the Yellowstone is ecosystem is that the pressure that wolves and other predators put on elk, for example, helps uh, the the, re the reproductive aspects of willow habitat and aspen habitat, it limits damage to, to those habitats and, and allows those forests and, and wetland areas or willow riparian areas to, to thrive. And redundancy is a big part of it. If you lose one, you know, at least the other apex predator can sort of pick up some of that, some of that ecological service, so to speak. And in this uh, coastal ecosystem, I mean, this is a very sim simplistic little picture here, but there's just no question that sea otters have this similar top-down effect uh, on, on kelp by consuming kelp herbivores like, like urchins. And uh, the sunflower sea star has a, also consumes urchins and, and, and has a similar influence on the kelp ecosystem. Of course, what we know now is that sea otters also have uh, an effect, a, a, a top-down trophic cascade effect on eelgrass in a positive way. So that, this is sort of the sea otter and the sunflower sea star have the redundancy between those two predators is definitely important in the coastal ecosystems of Oregon. But as, as Peter mentioned, we've lost sea otters not recently, we've actually lost them quite a while ago. Um, and so unfortunately, we, we don't have a very crystal clear idea of how much kelp was on the Oregon coast during the, the sort of apex of, of otter populations pre-Euro-American uh, pre and, and, and European fur, fur hunting. And so, but fast forward just a few years ago, you may have heard of the sun, the sunflower sea star issue. The, there was a sea star wasting disease that really erupted in the Pacific Range 
in about 2013 and 14. And although some of those species have actually rebounded and there's some promise there, um, the sunflower sea star really has not, at least in California and Oregon, and the International Union of Conservation of Nature has just uh, essentially you know, identified them as critically endangered. And that, that was not just a, a shooting from the hip sort of determination that was based on a, a lot of population surveys across their range from Baja to, to Alaska. And uh, they documented an over 90% decline, um, which is estimated somewhere in the ballpark of over, you know, five and three quarter billion animals. Um, and so it's a real big deal. I mean, this is sort of on the, on the uh, scale of say, the mountain lion being vanishing from the North American West. It, it's a really, you know, significant deal. So now we're looking at this ecosystem. And, and if we're going to talk about the kelp ecosystem, we're looking at a kelp ecosystem with that has mi missing two of these main predators of the of a kelp herbivore, such as urchins. And so we're seeing this new phenomenon, and that's purple sea urchins showing up in really large numbers in the subtidal regions, which wasn't really what it's not necessarily a natural place for purple sea urchins, but they're much more, or they're slightly more mobile than a red sea urchin. And they are sort of moving out into these kelp areas and mowing them down. And, uh, but we also have the issue of climate change, uh, ocean acidification. And so we're looking at a crossroads here. And I think a lot of marine biologists are, are very concerned. Um, and, and so we really need to think about solutions. Here's a before and after picture of Port Orford. Uh, to, to give you an example, the picture on the left is, you know, standing kelp, and the picture on the right is a, is a purple sea urchins um, essentially removing the kelp. And, you know, you have to understand this is a natural phenomenon, right? In, in, in the, if you were here in the Oregon coast in, in 1400, uh, you would have seen urchin barrens. It's just the percentage or the, or the, the, the extent of them, uh, which I think is shifting. And really what, you know, might help you think about this is the idea of two different stable states. And so there's the kelp ecosystem is a stable state. Kelp is of course very important because it's a primary producer. It takes the sun's energy and puts that into the marine ecosystem literally. And so uh, the kelp ecosystem with predators like sunflower sea stars and sea otters is a stable state. And then if you remove you know, some of those predators or if there's this upheaval in, in the system, uh, similar to say the removal of, of an apex predator, you will get this shift and into the, the urchin barren state. And the problem with the urchin barren state or the reason why it's so unusual is because unlike other, uh, most other populations like prey species, even without a predator, there's disease. As prey populations increase, they become more dense. Uh, they, you know, they run out of food because they've essentially eaten themselves out of house and home. And at a certain point, they collapse without a predator. I mean, that's a very common phenomenon. You see that in deer. Uh, we see that right now with white-tailed deer and you know, chronic wasting disease. We have, you know, Lyme's disease and we have uh, a variety of other disease that are erupting out of populations that are, that are too big and too dense. But in, in, with sea urchins, it's very, uh, it's a very unique situation because they, they have this ability to go into a sort of a, what you'd call a torpor, but it's really a, a sort of uh, zombie state where if they run out of food, they can sort of ratchet down their metabolism and live on the ocean floor for decades, and, you know, even almost a century. It, they have an extraordinary life history. And so that very unique part of their life history is really the, the crux of the matter with, with in the kelp ecosystem and why we're, a lot of us are talking about this now is that without something to uh, relieve some of those or remove some of those urchins, um, that really there's nothing that will change. It's a stable state. And of course, it's a less productive stable state. Um, so let's talk a little bit about kelp. I and mean, we know kelp is important habitat. In, in Oregon, it's mostly bull kelp. That's the neurocystis. And uh, there are a couple places in Oregon, or at least one, where you can find giant kelp. But it, it you know, it's, it develops structure, so it provides structure. Um, it is a nursery of biodiversity and productivity. It's famous as a fish refugia for 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 forage fish and for juvenile fish. It captures the energies, you know, energy captures the sun's energy, as I mentioned, which is really important, and delivers uh, nutrients into the into the ecosystem through just the shedding of kelp itself as it sheds. 
uh, material, it, that material is flowing through the water column and is a food for many, many marine species. Buffers ocean waves and currents. Um, and, you know, it's, it's just an incredibly important resource for uh, commercial fisheries and recreational fisheries. Um, and we all know, we've all heard about, you know, rockfish and kelp and that connection, but salmon is also uh, benefits from kelp. So when we talk about a reversal of this condition or reversing to a more of a more kelp and, and more of a, a frequency or, or density of kelp on the Oregon coast, you know, how do we do that? How do we, it's not going to be black and white, right? We're not talking about a situation where we want to go back to just kelp is literally constant ribbon of kelp from the entire you know coast of Oregon because that's not possible. But what we can do is uh, hopefully increase kelp's coverage and how do we do that? So sea otters. You know, sea otters are this famous keystone species that uh, when we talk about keystone species, we're talking about species with a disproportionate influence on, on their in the habitat around them. And uh, it ex extends beyond just their immediate needs of food and space, you know, influencing the ecosystem, like its structure, its, uh, it, it, the way it functions, the amount of uh, sort of trophic complexity in an ecosystem. And the story about understanding this phenomenon, the sea otter as a keystone species, started in the early 70s with Dr. Jim Estes. And Jim at the time was a, trying to locate and essentially uh, identify a master's project. And so he had the opportunity to go out to the Aleutian Islands and uh, to try to pick a study. And he was out there looking at a couple of different islands, Shemya and Amchitka. And what he found was this incredible uh, sort of light bulb moment where when he was in and uh, in on one island, th there was no otters present and he saw a very little kelp and a lot of sea urchins. And when he was on the other island with with a lot of otters present, he saw much more kelp and less sea urchins. And so that prompted him to do a study. And that's of course now a famous landmark study in ecology that essentially describes sea otters as this keystone of, of the kelp ecosystem. But researchers went on to study this phenomenon in more detail. So this is, there's a lot of, uh, not just in the Aleutian Islands, they, they studied it across the, the, the range of, the historical range of, of sea otters. And what they're finding is that it's there's a lot of nuance to the story where where you have sea otters, um, you know, bald eagles hunt more fish because there's more fish present and they hunt less uh, gulls and other waterfowl, for example. Um, there's a higher degree of, of fish abundance in, in fish abundance in general. Um, gulls tend to you know increase their diet of fish as opposed to mollusks and other and other uh, scavenging. And there's a much higher level of muscle growth because there's more kelp detritus in the water with sea otters than there are without sea otters. And, and these little anecdotes, which well started as anecdotes, are now part of a really significant canon of, of sea otter research. And so this is giving a little bit of a map of what this looks like or a timeline. Uh, you know, you get to an area that has, say, a high density of sea urchins and over time, uh, once you put sea otters in, you know, once sea otters have been reintroduced or they disperse to that area where they hadn't been before, within one year, uh, two years, three years, and up to six years, you'll see a response from kelp. And so in past 10 years, it's a, it's a robust kelp uh, forest. Some people have referred to it as sort of old growth kelp, but it is a dramatic uh, change in the ecosystem. And there's less sea urchins and abalone that are sitting on the ocean floor and more of them hiding in crock, cracks and crevices in the rocks and, and more kelp uh, around them. I wanted to take a pause here though to talk about the science uh, and try to put it in context because you know science is often quoted or used um, or, and cited by lots of different people for lots of different reasons. And you know we're in this sort of era of fake news, so I wanted to try to contextualize the sea otter research. Um, we've often talked about science as just when we go to high school or we're in college and we're talking about the scientific method. You know, folks will talk about observation and forming a question, making a hypothesis, test the hypothesis. But in reality, you know, the scientific method is much bigger than that. And there's some context here for sea otters. You know, you analyze the data, you write a paper, you submit the paper for peer review. 
uh, you publish it and you, scientists will often rebut it or critique it. And then your, the paper stands or fails over a pop process of two, three, four, five years, 10 years or longer. And then you know, some of the results are repeated by others successfully. And then it becomes a significant enough set of work that researchers start citing it frequently. And then you know, it becomes an established phenomenon in, in that discipline. And so that is the context we're talking about here with Seattle Research. It, it, it's over 40 years old. It's been repeated in multiple places in multiple regions. It's a very substantial uh, body of work in ecology. But what do scientists like talking about? They like talking about what they don't yet have an answer to. And so that's one of the things that I think uh, we're hoping to do a better job at is you know, really interpreting this important body of work because scientists like to talk about the next thing. They're not necessarily going to, to summarize what we know. They're going to be you know, really grappling with what we don't know. And so we're hoping to you know, remind everyone this in this conversation because it is important context. But beyond this interesting and deep knowledge about kelp and sea otters, what we, what's more recent in the last, say, 10 to 15 years is the relationship between sea otters and eelgrass and seagrass in estuaries. And so there's, there's a number of important studies that have come out that show that sea otters are, are having a benefit to, to kelp or to, sorry, to seagrass. And, and we know seagrass is important in estuaries. Obviously, it improves water quality increases the productivity of, of the estuary. It's important for salmonid and other fish habitat. And, and we know like kelp, it, it, it's a major, uh, potentially major solution to carbon sequestration. So this is what happens in eelgrass. And I just wanted to mention this uh, in addition to the kelp phenomenon. There's these little sea slugs and snails that graze the algae that's, that will establish themselves on the grass blades of, of eelgrass. And uh, those, Sea slugs have some natural predators and some invasive predators like the, the invasive green crab that will you know, consume them. And without those sea slugs in place, a lot of algae becomes established on eelgrass and it really, uh, the eelgrass suffers quite a bit, does not, uh, it's not as healthy, it's not able to photosynthesize as, as, as effectively and, and therefore um, eelgrass beds are not necessarily going to grow and expand at the rate they would with, in, without those important grazers. Uh, algae grazers. So when, when otters are in that system, they are able to eat a lot of crabs. And so that essentially releases these, these algal grazers back into the system and, and we have a clean, healthy stand of eelgrass. So, and I mentioned, you know, carbon, but it's important to go back and, re and emphasize that we're in a situation where, where managers, uh, natural resource managers are looking at carbon and carbon sequestrations and solutions to that. And, and, and both kelp and eelgrass are, are significant. Here's an example of, of an ocean area with kelp and without kelp in one acre. It's a dramatic difference. We used to think that, well, how can kelp sequester carbon? It's a, it's a living organism. It, 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 and actually bull kelp is a, uh, an annual. So when it dies, it releases the carbon back into the water. But what some new research has demonstrated is that it actually, due to ocean currents, a lot of the kelp biomass, uh, the dead kelp biomass essentially is, is sequestered in deep water and, and, and does not come back into the system. Um, so there's a net, a net sequestration of, of carbon, which is interesting. But uh, you know, there's talking about the benefit of kelp. There's more to the story, and so we know that that uh, kelp is a very important habitat for gray whales, and uh, and we we just recognize that although sea otters and kelp is an important topic to talk about, and there's important benefits for for some specific species like rockfish and salmon, that there's a lot of other uh, species to consider. If we are able to reintroduce sea otters, you know, there's other things that will benefit. So I wanted to talk a little bit about just the nuts and bolts here, talk about some restoration realities, where we're at and where we're going. Um, this is gonna take some time before there's gonna be a solid proposal and, and possibly an actual reintroduction, reintroduction effort that, that has been engaged. It could take you know three to five years. Um, there's a cooperative effort among many entities in Oregon uh, or it will require this co cooperation amongst uh, many folks, many stakeholders and agencies. We're going to need more public support. 
And we're going to need to really understand this from a nuanced point of view in terms of the economic pros and cons to say various fisheries like shell fisheries to, as opposed to fin fisheries. And we're gonna need to acquire you know, sustained funding. So it's a promising, promising proposal, but there are some realities to, to consider. Um, you know, there's a lot of some benefits, some really important benefits that Peter talked about, restoring this cultural connection to to uh, coastal Indian tribes and sea otters, and uh, the benefits of sea otters being being there. Um, it could be, as I mentioned, a, a, a boon for commercial or recreational fin fish interest, but um, it in tourism, wildlife viewing certainly. But it could have some possible conflicts, uh, such as the Dungeness crab industry and you know recreational and commercial uh, or competition with recreational crabbers and clam, clam diggers. So, you know, those are things to consider. I did, however, want to just mention this. Peter touched on this a little bit, but when we think about those conflicts, that conversation really has to start from a really important reality, and that reality is the the vast difference between. Southeast Alaska, where there is significant con conflict with subsistence harvest of clams and crabs uh, and sea otters, in Oregon, uh, where certainly there are there is a clam or significant sorry Dungeness crab industry in 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 Oregon, but the the context is different because of this geomorphic difference between the two places. A lot of the the harvest of crabs and clams in Southeast Alaska is in this large network of bays and inlets and islands where there's a lot more shallow shallow water. There's a lot more overlap between sea otters and crab populations and, and, and like. And there's also just a much higher carrying capacity for sea otters due to this nature of this, this region, as opposed to Oregon, where you have these this sort of north-south linear coastline. Certainly there's rocky subtidal areas, especially in the south. But there's a lot of stretches of sandy subtidal areas that don't have, uh, essentially, could not support kelp, and yet have dungeness large dungeness crab populations. And and you know the dungeness crab uh, effort, the commercial effort is is mostly in deeper water. So that's an important context that that really needs to be the foundation for for the conversation. So what are we up to now? Uh, right now, here in 2020, 2020 we've. Uh, been implementing the strategic plan, you know, ongoing consensus building and outreach to stakeholders and to the public. We've begun this feasibility study and an economic impact assessment, which is on its way now. The folks in the in the photo here are the the authors of the feasibility study, and they're the sort of the the Hall of Fame of Sea Otter research. Jim Estes there, Tim Tinker, um, Sean Larson, Seattle Aquarium, James Bodkin, Jan Hodder, uh, and Mike Murphy from the Monterey Bay. Aquarium, um, and so we will be working on that. This is being this is essentially almost done this spring, and it'll be released in the fall or in the late summer, probably. We did a, a virtual sea otter symposium last fall, and uh, we will do another one this fall. And this is an important piece of news. Late in 2020, uh, we worked with Merkley staff to insert some language into the 2021 fiscal budget with respect to sea otters. And so it directs the Fish and Wildlife Service to assess the West Coast uh, sea otter restoration on the West Coast writ large. And so we think that's a, an important, very compatible uh, benchmark to, to be looking at in addition to what we're trying to do here in Oregon. So, uh, it, you know, the late summer in 2021, as I mentioned, the, the feasibility study and the economic impact assessment will be rolling out. So, so look for that in maybe August, September. And uh, these studies will be looking in detail at a lot of dimensions of this of this uh, question. And we're just going to continue to do our outreach and engagement. With, and uh, we'll be, you know, leading this will be uh, Chanel and myself. And look for more webinars and and more resources to come. And check out our website. There's a place to donate there, and you can learn more about all the other uh, activities we've been doing and and. and get more resources there. There's a pretty deep portal of information about Seattle science and ecology and, and more there. So that is that. Wow, well, that was amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, everybody listening, you know, we could give a 
a round of applause for our presenters. Uh, we won't hear you, but we'll, we'll feel, we'll feel it. Um, that was really, really great. Um, I know that there's been some questions being asked and uh, Peter has kind of been fielding the questions as we, as we go, but I think um, a few of those might merit bringing back to the surface and, and sort of speaking about them um, just to make sure that everybody is, is hearing the answers. So one Absolutely. Of the, yeah, if that's okay with you guys. Um, one of the questions uh, was about sea otters. Can sea otters live with a warming ocean? Um, and Peter, you, you sort of answered that. Do you want to maybe field that uh, verbally as well? Yeah, so I, I mean, the, the basic thing to know is that the original extent of sea otter habitat did go down to much warmer waters than we have here off the Oregon coast, all the way down to uh, southern Baja. Um, so that um, although we know that, you know, sea otter populations can withstand or, or can thrive in warmer ocean temperatures, there are huge uncertainties that are created by um, uh, you know, the, the secondary effects that we're seeing, like ocean acidification um, uh, y and, you know, in, in the increasing instance of uh, different kinds of disease, you know, the sea star wasting that we've seen uh, is just one example. Um, there are all kinds of other effects of uh, human activity that have uh, detrimental effects on sea otter populations, um, uh, such as uh, parasites like uh, toxoplasmosis that can transfer through sewage from domestic pets to sea otters um, and other kinds of um, you know pollutants that we uh, put into the water. Um, so um, John would you like to add to that too? I, I feel bad taking kind of oh yeah no problem, too far yeah. over my skis. <laughs> no no it's um I, yeah I think that what Peter says right it, you know considering ba or Baja did have a population of of sea otters, of course, you know, there's this, the, the Pacific coast is largely this upwelling system that brings cold water uh, into near shore environments and very high nutrient water. But uh, there's a, there is, there are some tipping points and, and probably it may not necessarily be with the otters directly, but it'll be indirectly. And those tipping points um, can have to do with ocean acidification and prey base like clams and the develop or the development, developmental aspects of some of these prey populations. Uh, tipping points that have to do with the, actually kelp itself and the growth of kelp in warm water, which kelp does not thrive, do well in warm water. So I think that's where the, the real unknowns are popping out and, and the surprises in terms of like, you know, what we look in Oregon and, and there was a collapse in uh, oyster, you know, oyster larvae due to ocean acidification. So those are, that's I think where it's going to be. Um, and so we, we hope that I think, you know, with otters in the water, otters have a broad diet. And I think the benefit to that is that they're more likely to be able to persist with some fluctuations like that, given that they have a fairly broad prey base. And as long as there's healthy populations of, in a diversity of choices, I think it, it, it's hopeful. All right. Yeah, and we're super lucky to, to have the feasibility study team that, that uh, John was just talking about. Uh, and. Uh, being able to address some of those potential risks and, and longer term impacts and um, so to make sure that any reintroduction that does happen is uh, designed in a way to have the greatest possible chance of success even given those uncertainties. Um, yeah that's, that's a tough one. It sounds like they have resilience and that varied diet to help them succeed but there is a potential for climate change to be an issue of course especially if it's like messes up that ocean conveyor belt system and ch changes everything but you know mitigating climate change one way of doing that would be to reintroduce these sea otters to re-establish the kelp populations to sequester carbon so there's a way of uh, yet another way of kind of combating uh, the climate change situation um, all right well great answer let's try another one here um, and I did want to jump in and answer one question that I saw that I can answer, which is that um, this presentation is being recorded and it will be um, 
put up and hosted on, on our website, the Mid Coast Watershed Council. And uh, I'm not sure, John or Peter, if you have plans on, on putting that up, this up as well on yours, but- um, Yeah, we can. Yeah, information is, is available as you guys have mentioned on your, on your website. Um, let's see, I'm gonna just jump to one that I thought was interesting. Uh, there's a lot coming in, but you, you, you wanna go ahead, Peter, sorry. Oh, just sorry, I, I promised Jerry, um, he had asked that we address uh, the relationship between otters and the crab population. Um, and uh, I thought John would be most able to speak on uh, some really interesting research about uh, the interaction between sea otters and, and uh, and Dungeness crab uh, that uh, came out in ca from California. Uh, yeah, there was a, a the, the issue. Yes, otters do eat Dungeness crab. They eat a lot of other crabs in estuaries. You know, they'll eat like some of the rock crab or, or red crab, green crab. But definitely, they eat Dungeness crab. Um, it's not the top of the prey list in estuaries, but it but it could be in certain localized areas. And uh, and so the research that's that has just recently come out in California looked at where uh, studying, evaluating crab harvest rates and trends in, the, in areas associated with, with, um, with sea otter areas. And in other words, not necessarily in a literal overlap, but in the offshore areas where they are putting crabs, where the commercial fleet you know, takes crab, uh, a lot of those crab populations are dependent on the near shore environment for reproduction. So they looked at crab harvest in those areas associated with where otters have been in California and, and as you may know, the otter population in California has been growing and is more or less close to a carrying capacity. And what they found was that uh, the, the crab harvest rate catches have been growing in addition to, the, in to, to sea otters. And so there was no observed negative effect of sea otter populations on crab, crab harvest. And they, they accounted for effort and things like that. So it's, it's a fairly sophisticated piece of research. Um, you know, we ex that might sh be that that that's a sign that you know here in Oregon, there's it's a similar uh, fishery in the sense that you know in the south, as I mentioned, southeast Alaska, you have a lot of subsistence harvest or small vessel harvest in much shallower waters where their overlap between crabs and sea otters is more more overlap. So it could be that in in Oregon, we we don't see as much uh, impact similar to what they saw in California. So it, it it'll be it's a, certainly a question question but but thus far research shows that sea otters do not inhibit harvest of, of dungeness crab well i think in california it shows that and and i think the at least the information coming out of southeast alaska is that there is some significant impacts to say indigenous subsistence harvests and some other trees but that as i mentioned the you have to look at that the southeast alaska area in, with it with a critical eye because those are there's such a unique habitat there. There's, it's a it's an incredible carrying capacity of sea otters, as I mentioned. And so I think there's there is there are anecdotes or there are examples that sea otters are having an effect on fisheries. But I think it's important to just look at the different case studies and where they are and what's unique about them or not unique about them. Great, thank you. Well, um, this one strikes me as as an important question. Um, so you. Peter spoke about how there was a reintroduction effort in the past and essentially it, it failed. And you spoke to some of the reasons as to why, why that failed. But um, so how would the efforts you are making with the Alaka Alliance be different than the past effort? And why would we expect it to succeed this time? Yeah, around? I'll add a little bit of context to that. And Peter covered some of the, the reintroduction and and he, you know, when he mentioned, yeah, 19, early 1970s, it's important to put a couple dates on, you know, I'll try not to make this a long rambling answer, but it's a, it's a fairly nuanced thing. In the, the field of conservation biology, in terms of an identified field where people were calling it, like, you know, calling it conservation and biology and trying to reintroduce species or, or and recover species like sea otters, that paradigm really started in 1978, 1980 in, in, as a discipline. So 1970, 1971, you know, th these were very crude methods. So there is that aspect to it. And there was some really bad luck. They, they were apparently in one of the main, couple of the major, uh, you know, vessel trips to, to deliver a lot of these animals to a specific places 
uh, hit some terrible weather, like freak summer storms. So there was a combination of that. But apparently in all of the reintroduction locales that, that happened during this early era associated with the Aleutian Island nuclear testing, and, and even since then in San Nicolas, that there's this establishment phase is tough. So there's a fair high level of what you'd call attrition or animals dispersing out of there for a variety of reasons. And so, you know, it was common. What happened in Oregon was not uncommon. You, you put a hundred otters in an area and you might be left after two to three years of 20 or 30 otters. That's so what the, the difference in these other sites was that a lot of these other sites had a follow-up supplemental releases. And so you can imagine that there's a tipping point there and some folks may have familiar with the viability, like a minimum viability population size. And so when, what that talks about is how a population gets to a certain point below which natural mortality will actually drive the population to, to extinction just by random happenstance. You know, something, a thing, you know, an animal gets hit by a car, there's a, a, a disease thing happens, uh, a bad wildfire happens. So that phenomenon, uh, there's that viability threshold. And so in order to keep your population above that, you know, you, what these folks have learned, the Sea Otter, you know, researchers have learned through these examples, these historical examples, is to keep putting females in, or let's say, you know, three to four females a year. If you do that for 10 years, the math pencils out completely differently. And all of a sudden you have a population that's below a threshold. You get it just over that hump and you're in a place where, you know, where you can actually have a growing population. And so that's what happened in Washington. It's what happened in San Nicolas. It's what happened in Southeast Alaska, but it didn't happen in Oregon. They didn't do follow-up releases. And so we think the habitat's there, the prey's there, you know, it, but we did, it'll just be a more uh, educated process this time around. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Sorry uh, for the long answer. <laughs> no, it sounded like it, it merited that, that level of detail. So uh, there are a lot of questions and we could probably be here a long time answering them. Um, oh, we're good. I'm good for a few more. Yeah. Okay. Maybe we'll try to try to aim for just two or three more. Um, I saw this one seems like maybe might be a short answer, uh, but important. It says if sea otters are seen in Oregon, who should the observations be reported to first? Who should they not be reported to uh, in order to protect them? Yeah, I don't, I mean, sea otters have been and continue to be uh, observed as sort of vagrant, you know, individuals, usually young males that are moving south from Washington and they don't stay because there's no females or no existing population to capture their interest. And so the, the sea otter, I'm just going to go back to a little sea otter biology here, but females uh, have this incredible demand on them metabolically. They're raising pups, they raise one a year and when they have a pup, like the baseline for sea otters is 25% of their body weight. They have to eat and food every day to keep themselves going. So with a pup, it's more than that. And so for that reason, females can't afford to just go on expeditions and not know for sure what's going to be around the corner for food. And so sea otters have a very slow, sea otter populations have a slow dispersal rate because of that reasons. That's not to say that those males don't peel off and just go on a, you know, a giant expedition. But, um, so that's why they're seen in Oregon now occasionally, but they don't stay. Uh, I'm not, I don't think there's a big concern over, you know, reporting it. I think, you know, it's fine to report it to the, to the ODFW and to the Fish and Wildlife Service, certainly report it to us and we would tell the same people. But uh, really those sightings, until there's a, a base of a population in the state, those sightings will probably continue to happen, but they will probably be inconsequential unless there's bigger populations much closer. Okay, I feel like that kind of answered a couple questions. Um, let's see. Um, carbon storage, you kind of touched on that. Uh, how about, I understand that sea otters are, are preyed upon by sharks in a healthy habitat. How uh, do they evade those predators? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a, uh recent phenomenon that there's actually a new paper about that, that where these re researchers in, in California linked 
a change in the movement patterns of juvenile great white sharks into sea otter zones related to the change in, in increase in water temperatures further south. So the, the change in water temperatures actually push great white sharks, juvenile great white sharks north and put them overlapping into an overlapping space with sea otters. That's one recent paper that came out, it's pretty interesting. The other aspect is this aspect of a, of a shark fence in, in the sense that here you have this vestige of a remnant population in California that's grown, but it's still unconnected to anything else. And so it's sitting there and as it grew, it, you know, and the pinniped populations have recovered due to the Marine Mammal Act and things like that. And uh, so there's more pinnipeds, there's more great white sharks. And as sea otters grew, they're, they're, what, they're estab what they ran into was this sort of shark fence, this high density of great white sharks, which prohibited a lot of their dispersal you know, in an ideal world, you wouldn't really have to worry too much about that if you're just focusing on reintroducing or sea otters to more of the other areas. In other words, the shark fence is really a phenomenon of the fact that there's no sea otters outside of that area. So, uh, you know, there's a high frequency of mortality going through this quote unquote fence, even though some otters certainly would make it. But the more areas that have sea otters, the, the more, the less likely that's an issue. Um, and, and it looks like they're not even eating them. They're, they're actually biting them and then thinking to themselves, well, that doesn't taste like a fatty seal. And then they, you know, drop it. It still kills the sea otter, obviously. But. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's how it works with us surfers sometimes, too. Yeah. Not fun. Um, well, if the, the audience doesn't mind indulging in one of my questions I had for you guys, um, I'm kind of curious. I've heard some... Um, discussion of kelp farming becoming uh, a, a kind of a new thing and trying to get get kelp and other um, seaweeds kind of on, on the menu and it, it's got many benefits some of which you spoke to yeah uh, is that happening in Oregon and are you trying to partner with any of those organizations or would that uh, interfere or, or benefit the efforts that you're making with regard to trying to bring the, the, the otter back? Um, any of those uh, dynamics there? Yeah, I know that, you know, it wouldn't, if, if, if kelp, uh, say a prospective kelp farmer wanted to establish kelp in an area that currently doesn't have kelp, that say, you know, it wouldn't necessarily be a major issue because, you know, it's not a net loss of kelp or they're not going into an existing kelp stand and and having harvesting activity. I think that ODFW is looking at kelp conservation strategy, right, as we speak for the future. I think they're gonna have to look carefully about uh, Oregon administrative rules that allow kelp harvest currently. And, and so sort of separating, there's the issue of, of harvesting wild, regular wild standing kelp versus farming kelp. My guess is, is that, you know, kelp farming is a thing in Maine because if you go up to Maine, it's a, a lot of sheltered waters in Maine. And so you could sort of do an operation like that without you know, completely risking your life every day. And uh, I'm guessing that the Oregon coast is probably has limited opportunities for kelp farming just because of the sea conditions and the exposure. But, you know, I don't know anything more than that. But I do know that looking at kelp ecosystem or kelp habitat conservation at the state level is something that I think folks are looking at now and realizing like we, they may need to look at some new strategies. Okay. Yeah, there was a a question that I, I think I forgot to bring up about um, Oregon State Legislature and, and where they stand on uh, this, this issue, kelp or otters, or, but it sounds like you, you're sort of addressing that at, at, at the moment, or do you want to add anything to what you just said? Well, legislation, I mean, there's just so folks understand, we're not proposing any legislation right now, or and none of our partners are with respect to sea otters. We're just doing this preliminary evaluation of the question. And the next step would be to potentially submit a proposal to the Fish and Wildlife Service to translocate sea otters, but that's, you know, down the road. Um, but in terms of legislation or rule changes, as I mentioned, I think ODFW and other partners might consider things like, you know, allowing more harvest of purple sea urchins, allowing or prohibiting potentially or limiting the harvest of kelp for other reasons. I mean, there might be a series of, of, of policy changes that might come about. And I don't know what those will be eventually, but I think folks are talking about it. Great, well, uh, did either of you see any other questions that you felt like uh, you wanted to speak to? 
Um, I think we covered most of them. Um, the majority of, of what you'll uh, see in the chat box and in the Q&A box is well done. So appreciate the amazing information, all sentiments which I, I echo. Uh, yeah, maybe we'll leave it at that with the q and I mean, I, we so appreciate you, you coming back and taking the time to educate us on this really fascinating and important topic. So, um, no problem. Thank well, you. thank you all. And if you have any further questions going forward, um, you know, our contact information is available on the website. Uh, we'd really welcome a dialogue about any of these topics. And uh, we're, we're really glad for your interest and, and uh, for all of you taking the time.